<laughs> Welcome to another edition of Anglican Unscripted, episode 437. I'm Kevin Carlson. I'm Gavin Ashenden. It's a Matthew's Day, the 21st of October, 2018. No, <laughs> September. September. Yeah, gr graciously, nobody watches this program for our accuracy in calendar dates. <laughs> knowing what number episode we're on you know people give us a lot of grace when they sit down and you know oh unscripted's on oh i can't wait to watch these guys because they truly are completely unscripted without cause and well that's we understand that um i'm going to respond to some viewer mail uh you guys have uh, obviously been watching and uh you're adding more and more comments which is great and uh a couple of these uh are important that we talk about uh one person wrote a couple weeks ago and said, Kevin and Gavin and George, please stop telling us how old you are and stop telling us how you, what your ails are and your surgeries and health oh, updates. Oh, but our health, yes, <laughs> yes, yes. yes. <laughs> and, I, and I can see that. Nobody wants to sit down and listen to um, <clears throat> midlife crisisers uh, sit down and talk about their health. And I, I get that. However, we, we do put this out as, you know, this is who we are. Uh, this is a, uh, a live program, and we want people to pray for us. We are true believers. We don't uh, say anything in a vacuum, and uh, we want to know who you are, what we go through, and what we talk about, and to be as completely transparent as possible. Uh, there's another uh, gentleman uh, said, After listening to the last episode, I felt I must share a few thoughts on my heart. First, all of you know I respect your commitment to the renewal of Orthodox Anglicanism. Thank you. However, I keep sensing a vortex in your perceived mission to fixate on well-being and politics in general. Understand, we, we do talk a lot more about well-being, but I don't think it's our fault. I think he's just making um, his mission more known. And as um, commenters on the church, we want to talk about it. Uh, we weren't this fixed on Roland Williams. Uh, obviously... George Carey was before the program, but I don't see Justin Welby as serving the church, serving Christ, and um, the liberal world and the news media and the Episcopal world would love for you to uh, think that he is the end-all be-all to the future of Anglicanism. Uh, Gavin, George, Alan, and myself don't see that. And I understand your criticism, this, but the show is not all well be all the time. Uh, just when he does things like, oh, this week he flew to Texas. <laughs> and the first church he goes, you know, it's just... Uh, we're not I mean, can, I, can I add a couple of comments to, to, to both of those? Sure. Well, but the, the, I quite understand the sensitivity to talking about well be. Mm -hmm. um, I, I feel it myself. Um, I was... Um, I was on Twitter and uh, this morning, and we've had some excitement, which we'll talk about shortly, about the Bishop of Gloucester, Rachel Treweek, saying things about gender. And her husband, who's a really nice guy, mm -hmm. um, defends his wife on Twitter quite rightly, you would do. And as we were, were just sending a few tweets out, he said, uh, effectively, he sent me a Latin tag saying, but do it in love. And, um, and I was aware I'd been getting really quite cross because one has to be passionate about the bride of Christ mm -hmm. and and her truth, um, and I'm aware that when it comes to well-being, it, it there's a real temptation, uh, not just him but also other public figures who have responsibility for the church, who say things in the public space that we believe uh, don't reflect the faith properly. It, it's actually very easy to get cross with them and and to turn into a kind of grudge. And I think one of the things that we have to watch ourselves very carefully for is, is not being angry with these people. On the other hand, we're usually responding to what public figures say in the public space and how they represent Christianity. And I think inevitably a show like this has to respond to the way in which people join up what, what they say the faith says and, and what other people uh, looking at scripture say, say, say it says so I think your your correspondents are right to be careful mm -hmm. about the way in which we focus on public figures but on the other hand 
we can't not. We just have to try and do it with a certain amount of charity and love. Well, and I do want to contrast Rowan Williams, who was, you know, if he said something, you never knew what he really said. He could take both sides of an issue in 45 minutes of a, of a sermon or a talk. Uh, Frank Griswold was famous for that as well. However, uh, Justin Welby will tell you exactly uh, what he thinks, where he's taking the church, and how long it's going to take to get there. And because he's a little bit more uh, transparent in his goals, uh, it's a little easier to talk about it, especially some of the wackadoodle stuff he does. Um, it, it just made for a show like this. But no, I agree. I don't want to be Welby TV. We are Anglican TV. We are Anglican Unscripted. And we like to talk a, a, a lot of... Uh, a lot about a lot of different topics and i think also people don't know what you're like as an editor so i mean i want to tell people that that occasionally we get a show and you say to me after we've had a conversation which i think has gone pretty well really you say gavin that was useless uh, you you are too polite yes. <laughs> you're too ambiguous <laughs> too paradoxical too sensitive too nuanced shut it <laughs> tell the truth try it again <laughs> and i have to get over my my English sense of perpetual diplomacy in order to try and tell the truth. Because I think I recognize you're right. If we're not telling it like it is, as best we can, if we're trying to please people, be diplomatic, be over nuanced, then um, that can be very dull and really quite unhelpful. So I'm not sure that people understand quite what high standards you bring to the show as editor. <laughs> When it comes to cutting through the hot air, my, my hot air particularly. It, it's about transparency. Uh, transparency only works within the church. Uh, transparency can always be successful in, a, in this type of ministry. you got to be honest. And no, we don't want to just talk about Welby. It would be good to have a week we're not going to talk about Welby. This is that week. <laughs> <laughs> this is the week. <laughs> Hopefully, he doesn't do anything groovy by the end of the show. Um, let's talk about preferred pronouns. My preferred pronoun today, for at least till midnight, is male. He, man, me. You know, that's my preferred pronoun. Uh, what's your preferred pronoun, Kevin? Well, I'm afraid it's he too. Okay. Good. <laughs> although, Good. although I have to say, <laughs> yes, <laughs> in the interest of transparency, I have a very camp side to me, which loves musicals, singing. I, the, the one, of the first societies I joined at university was the ballet society. Uh, I even appeared on stage as a ballet dancer <laughs> in white tights. <laughs> I had long, I had long hair in my first year at university. Please tell um, me you have I pictures had, you can send me. <laughs> <laughs> I, I can't find it. Oh, I no. really can't find it. Uh, there was a reason. There was a reason why I was doing it. There was a a lady I liked who danced in the ballet society, and that was one of the reasons. However, I became a ballet dancer. Uh -huh. um, the, the reason this matters is because um, at the moment I'm getting some fairly uh, transparent emails, cross emails from people saying, "You've entered the the public fray about women bishops again," and and. Are you sure you're not just a, um, a phobe? Uh, and, and my response had been, well, look, there are some theological, that Archbishop Cranmer and I were having a spat this morning. And I said, you're, you're, you're forcing me to write again. He said, no one's forcing you. You've got better things to do. Um, <laughs> you know, theology is on both sides. Actually, the, 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 the practice of the Universal Church has not been on both sides. Mm -hmm. And there is a theological issue. Along with the theological issue, part of the problem is those of us who said that if you if you put feminists into the office of apostolic teachers in the church, don't be surprised if they bring with them the full feminist agenda, which is not Christian. And so one of the things we've had this week is two women bishops saying, we don't want you to call God he anymore. And, and, we, and, and even to the point of saying, it's dangerous to call God he around children. <laughs> well, hold on. I've been told by the... The, the the leaders of the gender wars now for years that we have to go by people's preferred pronoun and that before you can address a person especially in a university setting you need to ask them what their preferred pronoun is You're having so sneak that, that was my joke and oh, i no. wanted to get it in <laughs> <laughs> you're a little slow over there and so um it it, it is interesting yeah, it, it, it is interesting, you know, the, the preferred pronoun argument. Right now, you know, World War Three is gender wars. 
And uh, it, it's interesting to watch people demand that we call people by their preferred pronoun. Um, however, God has identified himself by what pronoun? Well, it's father. Father. Hmm. And, and the, on, the only way of dealing with this is to say that Jesus was so culturally limited, he didn't know what he was doing. Um, but to do that requires a, a very a low view of the Logos in whom all things hold together and through whom everything was made. But somehow he was culturally myopic and didn't know that God was beyond beyond gender. God is, of course, beyond sex. Um, one woman wrote saying, did you really think God has a penis? And I, the response to that is, no, there's a distinction between sex and gender. That's right. Actually, it's, exact, it's exactly the distinction that, that the whole trans movement is making. Um, they're not wrong in everything. Mm -hmm. The the difficulty. So so we have this week in England. We have two bishops saying don't call God children, God he uh, around children. We have a another bishop, the Bishop of Taunton, uh, promoting this new fashion of cathedral LGBT Eucharists, uh, and we know we understand very well that this is part of a progressive agenda that feminism has built into it. Um, but it isn't it isn't consistent with biblical faith and it isn't consistent with what the church has done always everywhere at all times it's a new politicized progressive agenda that is deeply sub-christian and 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 actually it's it's a great shame that that the presence of women bishops has accelerated this in the way it has and, and therefore it isn't sexist or phobic to say so but um this is one of the developments that has flowed before you've even done the theology from from having feminist bishops who then have responsibility for teaching apostolic truth. Now, in full transparency here, uh, feminism was thrust upon the, the church uh, by uh, 19th century Lutherans uh, out of Germany. Uh, I, you, know, you can go back and find it, you know, it isn't just centric to female bishops. It's, you know, been no, kind no, of I, a, a, I, a, 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 you know, a fool's notion within, you know, the church for the last 200, yeah, 250 years. Well, we, we, ought, we ought also to say that if we're going to have this discussion, you have to define your terms and there's, there's, sure, there's yeah. first wave, second wave, third wave, third wave feminism is the really dangerous one. Mm -hmm. but, but, but even if we had a kind of Christian masculinism, um, the, the the danger with we're, we're, we're going right against St. Paul in Galatians 3, the danger with any of this kind of party stuff, whether it's based on gender, age, or, or, in, or race, or anything else, is that it becomes something you said in conflict against something else. Mm. And, and we have enough trouble with men and women getting, getting on anyway. We have enough trouble with the old and the young getting on. But the moment you have a partisan movement within the church, particularly one that says... Um, that is not in, actually interested in equality. One of the difficulties that uh, we had with uh, Joe Bailey Wells, uh, the Bishop of Dorking, when she said, we can't use this he language because gender language isn't properly balanced yet. But, but this, is, um, uh, this is entirely deceptive. The, the aim of the progressive agenda is not to find a balance between men and women. It's actually to undermine the patriarchy. Mm -hmm. uh, Christianity... We, as Christians, we really do have to wake up to the fact that we have a problem. We have a problem that we're severely patriarchal from the beginning. Any any revelation that says you need to know God as Father, actually, it's not just language, but there's an internal mystical spiritual experience the Holy Spirit brings. So the Holy Spirit lets you call, produces your, this call from your heart, Abba, Daddy, Father. This isn't cultural conditioning. This is this is a, the intimacy of a particular spirit-given relationship. Now, to come along with a political agenda in the 21st century and say, you must pay no attention to the Holy Spirit, uh, but instead impose upon it political and uh, sociological agendas, this is a really dangerous and, and, uh, and problematic thing to do for the faith. No, I absolutely agreed. Uh, it's, it's bringing chaos. It's something the church has uh, no desire to correct so far. Uh, it's, it's interesting to watch. I just saw, read an article here on Daily Mail, uh, headline, student editor who retweeted article pointing out that women don't have penises is fired from his university post. As a this, this is doubly, 
This is doubly important. His name is, uh, because you told me just before the show, <laughs> so Angelos Sophocleos. Ah, uh, Angelos is, it, there, there are two things about Angelos <laughs> Sophocleos. One is he's at Durham, which is a really first-rate university. Mm -hmm. uh, and the second is that he's, that, he, that he's in charge of the philosophy journal, in the philosophy society's journal. Uh, and, and he thinks, um, like Germain Greer, um, that, you, that, that you need to know whether you're talking about gender or sex. Uh, and, and so when he says that the real women um, he doesn't say real women don't have he says women he doesn't say real he just says women <laughs> yes so it was I think it was it was a <laughs> let's forget who said yeah, it that's right no, go ahead. <laughs> transparency so, so whether you whether, whether you agree with him or not um, the fact that as uh, as editor of a philosophical society magazine and as a as a, a, a clever intellectual at one of our best universities he's shut up and fired this explains that we're not we're not just dealing even we're not even just dealing with the integrity of christian truth and the integrity of christian revelation one of the reasons i say to my secular friends they say gavin why are you writing these articles what why is it you're becoming well known for causing fuss in the public space and i say well it's partly because i want people to understand about the love of god and 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 jesus and christianity as it really is but it's also because um, we owe our free speech uh, both to this concept, but also if Christians lose free speech, we can't talk about Jesus. Uh, and if you lose free speech, you can't get to the truth. And it's this notion of Jesus and the universe having truth at the heart of it that led to the scientific revolution and allow us to have free speech and democracy. So many things hang by it. But this progressive revolution, which the, uh, what, the, the gender wars are just a part, are intended to close down free speech and when when somebody at Durham University lose, gets fired as editor of a philosophy journal because his views even though most of us would think they're perfectly correct are not acceptable we really are in trouble as a society well now it's not just a philosophy student you had a doctor in England this spring who was fired for saying uh, that basically the same thing men and women are different uh, biologically and by saying that, he got himself fired from, uh, you call yourself the National Health System or something over there, I, I forget what it was called. He was applying for a, gov he was applying for a government job okay. uh, as a doctor. And, and, and when, when the, the bureaucrats heard his, his perfectly normal, scientifically, uh, empirically testable views, they said, you can't be employed. And more and more, I have a sense that we're in a situation very like Germany, in the early 1930s mm -hmm. and you know you in, in in germany in the 1930s 31 32 33 hitler is hitler is is voted in uh, the, the the sensible people who ought to defend the constitution don't step up to the mark and slowly things get ratcheted up until you get crystal nacht and a, a, a tightening of a totalitarian grip on society what people can say what they can do what they can think who they are in public it's happening now to us in the west and the trouble is the very people who ought to stand up against this are the Christians, but they're first in the firing line. Um, and perhaps that's no surprise. If this is a spiritual struggle, as we believe it is, well, the Christians would be in the firing line. But, but we're losing the battle very quickly. Yeah. All right, let's transition to our last story. Um, there's always been discussion, at least for the last five years since GAFCON 2, whether or not we can work within the system of the Church of England to reform the Church of England. Um, for people like me, it's evident that there's just no way to work within it. However, there's plenty of great, wonderful, faithful men and women, uh, clergy, who are willing to keep trying to work within it. Um, obviously, Lee Gatiss, who's uh, the Church Society, uh, I can go down many others, uh, are working very hard to do that. There is also the Renew Conference, and I thought we could talk about that. They had their, uh, their event going on, and uh, they are trying to renew the Church of England. Um, let's talk a little bit about that. I know that uh, uh, people are eager to hear your side of the story. Uh, tell me, <laughs> <laughs> that's what my email box says, talk about Renew, where well, I want to know about Renew. Um, well, the, you know, this is, can you work within the system or not? And uh, uh, that's what we have Gavin here to tell us. Well, uh, so my, my self-disclosure is that, that I don't belong to that particular club. Um, and it's not just about not belonging to a club. It's also, I don't think the club would have me if I wanted to belong to it. Mm -hmm. part, part of the problem is that although I went to the most conservative evangelical seminary we have, 
I never truly belonged to that group. You, you, there are certain, there's a kind of English cultural tick box system. You have to have about six accredited uh, qualifications for belonging. And, and the difficulty with, with Renew is that it's a, it's a very distinctive group uh, at the Protestant end of the Church of England. Um, and one of the complaints I have about it is that it's not really Anglican. Now, well, that's not because I value... Well, let's back up here. I, uh, people need to understand it. Um, there's clubs based on your your place in society, the schools you go to, who you hang out with, who your parents know, uh, your property ownership uh, that exists solely in England. Uh, it's kind of this uh, chaotic caste society. And it's exactly what it is. It's a caste society. Right. And, and one of the difficulties about Renew is that it replicates the caste system yes. only in Christian terms. And therefore, if you don't have quite the right profile, you are a person of suspicion and you can't belong. So the, I, mean, I think everybody would agree with that. This isn't an unfair criticism. Uh, it's one of the really unpleasant weaknesses of being an Englishman uh, and our English society. And it's not just Renew, of course, it, it applies to a n number of different caste-like clubs. But the reason it matters in this case is that um, there is something virtuous about Anglicanism. There are lots of virtuous things about Anglicanism. Uh, it, it's, it's, it retains the structure of the apostolic church and it has within its breadth the capacity for being for exercising so much of the richness of, of the gifts of God, sacramentalism, mm -hmm. a, a, a constant desire to reform things, to get them closer to the word, and an openness to the Holy Spirit. One of the things that most attracted me to Foley Beach when I met him was he, he met a group of the kind of Renew cast to which I had been astonishingly invited, and I'm grateful that I was. And he said to them and to us, to their great surprise, if you want any help from me uh, in ACNA, then you need to, to you need to deal, you need to inhabit a kind of Anglicanism that is reformed, sacramental, and charismatic. That's what I stand for. Nice, good. Oh, I yeah. no, I jumped up and down on my chair. I was putting my thumbs up and rubbing my hands and saying, "I love this man. I can do business with him." Um, people were a bit shocked by that, but 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 the Renew Conference is is doing exactly the opposite, mm -hmm. and I think that's what's most difficult. It is in fact Congregationalist or Presbyterian. It's not it's not Episcopal in its outlook. Uh, bishops and and the structure of the church are a necessary rule for other members of the club, and in one sense, that's not a that's not the the worst thing that could happen to a group within the church. But the difficulty is. Um, it, they're determined to stay within the Church of England. Now, there may be strategic reasons for doing this, um, but Peter Jensen was invited to speak to them, and he said, "If I, I'm going to paraphrase him, and please get Peter on to tell me if I've, if I've <laughs> had it reported wrong. But no, I, I'm waiting for the press release, but go on. <laughs> <laughs> uh, Peter Jensen asked them where their red line was. He said, the, the red line should have been when the bishops told you you had to give communion to gay couples who live together. Mm. He said, you should never have crossed that line. And then I've heard you talk about, well, there are other red lines, and if the bishops and the teaching of the Church of England moves to this certain point, you can no longer in conscience stay within such an organization. But now he said to them, now you're waiting for a report on, on marriage that's coming out in 2020. And he said, you know what? I bet when that comes out, you'll move your red line again. Now, th th this is a conversation that, that they have to have between them. I I'm I'm simply on the side of the tennis court watching the ball go backwards and forwards. But I think, but I think you, people have to decide at what point uh, do you say that those people with authority to set the tone and the theology and uh, the, the core beliefs of a church, at what point have they moved beyond what is Christian? Uh, and uh, how long do you go on for the sake of convenience and practicality? staying within that particular group. You and I, Kevin, have left, so we're, we're doing special pleading. But there was this challenge at the, Re the Renew Conference. How long are you guys going to bend your red lines? Yeah, and that's interesting. Now, there's lots of faithful clergy still within the Episcopal Church whom I respect, honor. George is one of them, who are able to maintain uh, their red line. George has never, ever moved his red line. Uh, you know, but he's able to run a successful church under the cover of a, a conservative bishop remaining in the Episcopal Church. If those things change, 
uh, I would, I, George is the type of person who would uh, certainly make it difficult for those who want to change him. Uh, well, they don't exist. In, that's quite right. And George yeah. has said this from time. The trouble is, they don't exist in England. That's right. So the Bishop of Maidstone was set up precisely to provide that kind of episcopal cover. Mm -hmm. But uh, good and splendid man that he is, he suffers from a surfeit of collegial responsibility. He has to answer to the House of Bishops. And we've had a number of occasions now in the last couple of years when you would have expected Orthodox bishops to break ranks with the House of Bishops and say, this is not acceptable. As it happens, um, the, the, the just two bishops appear to be willing to do that. Uh, he's one of them, Rod Thomas, from time to time. He was at Gafcon. And, and the splendid Keith Sinclair uh, is another one. They both do it with great difficulty, with some embarrassment, with great courage, um, but they're, they're the only two. And those of us who are hoping they would give a more orthodox lead find that they don't do it very much. They, they, they are constrained. So the conditions that George is able to flourish with in tech uh, are, are much thinner on the ground. And part of the problem is when people write to me, they say, well, Gavin, OK, we think the lines are crossed, but where do we go physically? Where, where do we go? And that's a terrible problem. Yeah. One of the things I, I, George and I were talking about this, and one of the things I think that we, we believe, though our backs are against the wall, is that increasingly there's going to be an internet church. R rather like Calvin yeah, distinguished church, between yeah, the absolutely. visible, the, vi the virtual church. Calvin distinguished between a visible and an invisible church. The mm -hmm. visible was the structures of the state, of, of state churches and uh, the invisible church were true believers. I think we're moving to a point where reluctantly, and more and more people are going to belong to the virtual electronic church because that's where they find teaching and fellowship even if they can't get the sacraments or a hug Jeez, yes <laughs> or fired <sighs> uh, it's one of those things now i i think next time i i'd like to sit down and talk to you about how the english deal with conflict and how they think because you, you, you alluded to this earlier in the program you know kevin tells you to stop do, talking the way you're talking because <laughs> you just want to be diplomatic and we deal with that uh, you know um and i think in the next program i'd like to sit down and just talk about the, the that english mindset of diplomacy and how it's really hurt the house of bishops and the church of england uh when it comes to saying no and drawing a red line and keeping the red line I'm well, Kevin Collins. Yeah. Well, I was just going to say, if we do that, we must remember that there are lots of people in the north of England who pride themselves on calling a spade, as they would say, a bloody shovel. Oh, yes. <laughs> yes. It's, it's mainly the southern English. <laughs> and we must also remember that foreigners find our understatement extremely difficult when we, we appear to be saying the opposite of what we actually mean. So <laughs> we do make it more difficult for ourselves if you're a southern Anglic English Anglican to, to be clear about what what you actually mean but i i'd love to talk about it and meanwhile i'm trying desperately to remember what episode number it is is, is it three four seven three four seven we're down to three hundreds now no, no. four three four you three, got it four three seven, seven yeah. <laughs> i'm kevin carlson <laughs> i'm gavin ashton and this is indeed four three seven that you've been listening to <laughs> in, in 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 this 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 mixture of uh, american and english communication yes. um and God bless you and make it clear to you. I, I should tell people out there, you have never been insulted until you've been insulted by an Englishman. Because you did <laughs> not know you were just insulted. <laughs> just the, but you know, you know, Kevin, <laughs> you normally experience it as a compliment. Yes. <laughs> That's a mistake. You sit there going, oh, I feel good. No, wait. No, no. <laughs> <laughs>